Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry Taylor, and I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs lead their ideal lives by creating better businesses. I'm a certified EOS implementer, an FBA accredited family business advisor, and a business owner myself with several business interests. I work with established business owners and their leadership teams to help them live their ideal entrepreneurial life using EOS, the Entrepreneur Operating System. My guests authentically share the highs and lows of creating a successful business and how they turn things around in their business using EOS tools and traction, or they're specialists in their area of expertise. And they will actually share with you the things that you can do to improve yourself as an entrepreneur. Our light environment profoundly affects our hormonal cascade. I even like to say light is the conductor of our hormonal orchestra because, in fact, all of the hormones are going to be released in response to certain or certain types of light. And I think it's important to understand and to appreciate that light isn't just one thing. Light is information. It's information t- coming into your eyes or onto your skin, talking to your hypothalamus and pituitary gland in the brain and telling it what, what hormone or what neurotransmitters to make. Today's guest was brought to New Zealand to help formulate the Nutra Rescue products. She's a daughter of a doctor and her mother actually ran health food stores, so there's never any doubt about what she's going to get into. Um, she is actually a Kundalini Yoga teacher and practitioner, and today she's going to share with us uh, the effect of stress on both male and female hormones and how it can have a f- affect your actual health but also your relationships. So please welcome Dr. Vanessa, um, who's an integrative uh, physician. Uh, from Dr. Vanessa.life. Welcome to the show. Great. Thanks so much, Deb. Great to be here. And it's really good to have you back on the show again. So last time you came on board, we talked about a whole bunch of things. And today we're going to delve a little bit deeper into that, aren't we? So um, stress, it is one of those things that as entrepreneurs, we often get affected by it. And we think we've got it under control because we're you know, generally control freaks. But what effect can stress have on us in our lives? Well, I mean, I don't think a lot of people realize it, but stress... Now we know from research, it probably contributes to about 75 to 80 percent of all chronic disease. So when we're under either psychological stress, you know, environmental stress, um, even things like you know uh, things like inflammation in the body, chronic infections, that causes stress in the body that can impact every single organ system and contribute to pretty much all chronic disease. I think it's important to realize that. When we think about stress, it's not just psychological stress and work stress, but as I mentioned, things like environmental stress. So, you know, having light at the wrong time of day. We'll talk about that much more soon. And things like having chronic infections, gut dysbiosis, anything that turns on the inflammatory response in the body will trigger stress hormone and, and cortisol and cause physiological stress. Mm. And it's really interesting because the media has been covering a lot about, you know, um, women and menopause and all the effect of, on, on, but it, it, it affects men just as much, right? So stress can actually have um, an effect on their hormones and their physiological makeup as well too, right? Absolutely. When it comes to stress, so we have to think about it, uh, often we think about our sex hormones only to do with reproduction and fertility, but our stress hormones and our sex hormones are all made from the same precursor. And evolutionarily, we have, we have a choice to make. We either can survive or we can reproduce. And so anytime we're under chronic stress, again, be it environmental, physiological, or psychological, that's going to impact our stress, our, our sex hormones. So it's going to impact everything from how difficult menopause is for women to things like testosterone levels in men. And there's a lot of awareness around, you know, menopause and, you know, some of the, the effects of that on women's health. But men also will have a natural decline in testosterone. And there's even a name for this. It's called andropause. So as men get older, their testosterone levels will drop and they go through a similar change, not quite as dramatic. But we've seen from the research that since probably the 50s and 60s, testosterone levels in men are just chronic, getting lower and lower. So every year when we look at average um, serum testosterone in, in the male population, we see it declining. And this a big factor is stress, a big factor is environmental. We can get into all those reasons. But I guess the bottom line is just to understand that just as women go through a change in hormones, men will as well. And in fact, because of our life, because of our levels of stress and because of our environment, 
we're actually seeing a much more dramatic decline in testosterone and more difficulty as men get older in terms of their physical health, but really big also is their emotional health and their risk of anxiety and depression. So what, I mean, what is low, lowering testosterone? What does that really look like? What um, impact does that have on the way you present or the way that you react to things? Yeah, I mean, there's, in terms of looking at things like, you know, muscle strength and obviously libido and sex drive. But I think one of the things that we don't consider when we, when men have suboptimal or low testosterone is the effect on mood. So we see a lot of lack of drive, lack of motivation, just, you know, that feeling of apathy, not being able to complete tasks. Because we often think of testosterone as like, or, you know, aggression and things like that. But really physiologically, the effect on the, the body or the effect on the psychological state is more just the ability to persevere when things get tough. So testosterone and dopamine as well, which is closely tied, is all about being able to complete challenges and, you know, finish a workout or, you know, have a good day at work, you know, things like that. Um, and when testosterone drops, we often see that just lack of motivation, lack of being able to complete tasks, but also really big is the effect on the brain and um, in terms of just low mood. So depression is a big one. And, and depression, yeah, depression and anxiety are, are becoming more and more obvious in the, in the workplace, aren't they, in terms of, and particularly with men, I think. So what, what does, how does it present? What, what does that look like? Yeah, culturally, I think, you know, th there is this idea of men, especially in New Zealand, countries that are just get over it, you know, just, yeah, yeah, take a concrete pill, you know, keep going, whatever. But um, obviously, it's kind of undiagnosed and just very, like, chronic and low grade. So again, just not feeling fulfilled, feeling just a little bit down. Again, that lack of motivation, lack of drive is probably the biggest thing. And also it's interesting in men as testosterone drops, but estrogen increases. And we can talk about what causes in men, you know, higher testosterone or estrogen to testosterone ratio. We actually see more irritability. So when you think of the guys, you know, with road rage and just snapping, it's often not that they have, high, they often have lower testosterone and higher estrogen. And that just causes estrogen when it's too high in men it causes a level of irritability in the brain that just makes them a little bit more reactive interesting so what we're really sort of saying is that um it all it's all linked together right so you you find yourself getting stressed that will then lead to a decrease in the sort of testosterone levels which will then lead to perhaps not wanting to finish things perhaps feeling a bit down feeling a bit sort of miserable um and then that can also lead to irritability and it becomes a little bit of a cycle doesn't it in terms of you get caught up in that how how do you deal with it? What do you what do you need to how do you recognize it first of all? Then how do you deal with it? I mean, recognizing it probably is just to having a level of self awareness and also just open communication with partners and with work colleagues. You know, if if things like your performance is decreasing, either be it you know, sexual or something like you know at work you're just not doing as well, or you're having communication issues with your partner because you're a little bit more reactive then it's a good idea just to kind of step back and have the self-awareness to look at, is this a pattern? Is this just due to, you know, a chronic, um, an acute stress? Is, did something just happen? Or is it kind of getting worse? And especially if you see it kind of getting worse and just a decline in other things, especially physiologically, like maybe higher um, cholesterol levels in men because our testosterone and our cortisol are actually products of um, of cholesterol. So often if we're not making the sex hormones, sometimes we can see lipids looking a little bit funny and that can be because it's not flowing down to being, being made into the sex hormones. So you can, you can get your doctor to measure your serum testosterone. It's a blood test. It's important to also look at if you're, if you're a male, um, free testosterone as well as total. And there's a hormone or there's a carrier protein called sex hormone binding globin. And measuring all three of those together can give you a good sense of where you are and if it's declining. And for most men, it's actually a pretty good idea to get your baseline hormones done, um, your testosterone, your sex hormone binding globe, and your free testosterone, and also your estradiol, your estrogen, kind of midlife. So when you're at a like maybe late 20s, early 30s, when you're when you're feeling good, and then instead of looking at reference ranges, then you can revert back. You can look at those again and see not just oh it's normal in the range, but it's you know based on how I was, how I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're feeling perhaps a little bit sort of, yeah, like that something's not quite right, that you're not feeling as enthused and motivated as you have mm -hmm. been. You're feeling a little bit tired, a bit stressed. You go and have some of these, these tests done and it shows there's a, there's a pattern there, there's something to be looking at. What's the, what do you do next? <laughs> what are the first things that you would normally do when you're working with somebody like this? Because you work with a lot of entrepreneurs, obviously. 
I mean, one home test or kind of thing to kind of look at is testosterone is a circadian hormone, so it should rise in the morning. And when your testosterone is at a physiologically healthy level, what you'll often find as a man is you have morning erections, like unstimulated, you just wake up, oh, hello, it's there. So that's actually a really good thing to keep track of if, you know, that was happening a couple times a week and that's not happening at all. That can be actually a really good sign in the absence of getting a blood draw to let you know just in general how your your hormonal um, balance is. That is really good. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, home test. Yeah, home test. Home test. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting. We, when the, the intro, I said, you know, we're going to talk about how it actually affects relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, obviously, it's going to be affecting the person who's who's having these drops in testosterone levels, but it, it has an effect on the relationship, right? Absolutely. Because there will be changes there in terms of the irritability, mm-hmm. in terms of, um, I think, also from a male perspective, um, you know, that sort of you're expected to perform, you're expected to always be on, you're expected to be the man, you know? And so what effect does that have on the relationship? Absolutely. It's huge. And also just, I think that irritability is the big one. And then that, that kind of confidence um, shaking effect of, you know, you're not, you know, you're not doing good. So you're a little more irritable. And I think that affects relationships quite a bit. Okay. So we, we've done some of the home tests. We've, we've recognized there's some stuff going on that we, we're not so comfortable with. We might have done some actual physical tests as well with our doctor and we've, we're recognizing there's something going on. What are some of the common things that can influence, um, yeah, you know, can create stress because you talked about environmental, you talked about physiological. Give us some of the um, things that can actually cause stress. It's not just about being stressed at work and it's, it's busy. What else can actually cause it? Actually, one more thing, just to yeah. go back, really important. Another sign that maybe your androgens, your testosterone are a bit on the suboptimal side are if you're working out and you find you're not getting the results of your workout, so you're losing muscle mass or you're you know you're training a lot but you're you know you're not seeing the effect, and that's also a bit of a red flag for women and men. That your your androgens or testosterone, DHEA is another important hormone. You're just not able to kind of uh, maintain muscle or put on muscle. And that's bone, interesting. Bone density as well is a good marker. Okay. Sorry. No, that's good. No, that's really good. So, okay, so we're looking for things like, yep, so, you know, are you getting that morning erection? Are you perhaps not getting the results that you want from the gym? Are you finding yourself more irritable? Um, are you just finding yourself lacking in motivation to complete things? They're all signs that potentially something's going on. Yeah. Um, so where to from there? What do you do then? Yeah, then it's important to just consider the underlying causes and, you know, start, start simple before getting into kind of the details. I mean, the biggest one, I think I mentioned that um, testosterone is a circadian hormone. So basically the morning we wake up, it should be high and then it'll decrease throughout the day. And that's why when you go to take your blood test, they say do it before 7 a.m. because we want to get that peak level. But our light environment profoundly affects our hormone our hormonal cascade. I even like to say light is the conductor of our hormonal orchestra because in fact, all of the hormones are going to be released in response to certain or certain types of light. And I think it's important to understand and to appreciate that light isn't just one thing. Light is information. It's information t- coming into your eyes or onto your skin, talking to your hypothalamus and pituitary gland in the brain and telling it what, what hormone or what neurotransmitters to make. So in the morning, you have your testosterone release. If we don't get, if we don't have exposure to early morning light, and that's when the sun is low on the horizon, the light is made up of a few things. Infrared light is about 40%. Then we have visible light and you know, the brightness. And then we have UV light. In the morning, we have a lot of infrared light. We don't have a lot of UV. And that's a signal to make, to start to wake you up and the signal to make your thyroid hormones. So you need to get that morning light for your energy, for metabolism helps the testosterone throughout the day. The sun gets brighter. As the sun starts to get brighter, that's your cortisol trigger. So our cortisol, which is known as stress hormone, but it's also the hormone just to get us awake and get us moving and kind of wake up the body. And so if we don't get morning light, we don't make the thyroid cortisol. Our cortisol should be high in the morning and it should go low at night. So cortisol is most stimulated by blue light. And at the beginning, I said that at any time, our body has the, the has to make the decision versus are we stressed? Are we in survival mode? And that has to do with cortisol or are we in reproductive mode? So during the day, cortisol is high. Then our sex hormones as cortisol kind of goes down midday will get made. And 
But the kind of the moral of the story is if we have bright light throughout the period, especially that blue light, which is rich in our room lighting and our computer screens, if that light signal that stimulates cortisol persists after the light is supposed to go away after sunset, that stimulates cortisol. That puts us back into the the stress mode and that we don't make our sex hormones at night. So we don't make our growth hormone and all of the the hormones that kind of repair after, you know, we've had a stressful day. So the one of the big, big factors I see in a lot of the guys I are help and women as well is that light signal. So having light when it should be dark and not having the the normal uh, natural light, which kind of changes throughout the day. Any that'll increase cortisol and increase cortisol when it should be low. So anytime you're at your laptop or watching TV, that's increasing your cortisol and stealing the precursors for your testosterone. So light at night is a huge driver of hormonal imbalance and especially of low testosterone that I see in, in male patients. And so that comes from, as you said, being on your laptop and watching TV. Um, but even some of our lighting in our house can have an effect too, right? Because I mean, I've been laughing. Obviously, the listeners can't see, but we're sitting in a podcast room and we've literally got no, these no. bright the lights on that light right now. Yeah, my cool <laughs> glasses. <yeah. laughs> so let's just put on some yellow glasses and blue blocking light glasses, which is really important because the lights that we have in our environment, you know, the overhead lights in our homes, particularly in modern homes, we've got all of these down lights. Every single room's got 12, 24 down lights in it. It's a lot of light that we don't really need to have at that time of the evening. Is that right? Absolutely. And like I said, that'll keep you in that high cortisol mode. So light in the morning, natural light, really, really good for hormones. Light at night, really bad. And the other kind of part of the story is as the light goes away completely, we start to make melatonin or we start to release melatonin. It's actually made during the day when we have bright light and it's released at night when that light goes away. Melatonin uh, opposes estrogen. So in men and women, if you don't have the darkness at night, you have too much light, you have high cortisol, low melatonin, and then high estrogen because the melatonin doesn't turn the estrogen off. So then we have a situation in guys and women where we have estrogen dominance or high estrogen and low um, testosterone. So it's, it's such an important factor. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the blue blocking glasses is one way that you can actually do that. What else can you do to kind of um, ensure that you get the the right types of light at the right time of the day. I mean, people don't smoke anymore, which is amazing. But take sun breaks. Pretend you're a smoker. And if you work in an office, just go outside a few times a day. And with, you know, without glasses, so you get the natural light coming into your eyes. And even better if you get some on your skin, because we actually have a light sensing pigment in our skin, in our blood vessels, and our subcutaneous fat called melanopsin. And that is also in our eye, but really sensitive to the light. And we'll basically track as the light changes what time it is. And this, this idea of circadian rhythm or the body's timing underlies also all chronic disease. So when we see our, our light environment is off, it messes up our body's circadian rhythm. We see an inter- increase in cancer and cardiovascular disease is, is a big one in diabetes, in mental health disorders. And it covers a whole, pretty much the whole spectrum because it's such a foundational part of health. Because if we think about it for 3.4 ish billion year, billion years, should Google that that we've kind of evolved. We've had a planet with 24 hour light, light and dark cycles. So every part of our physiology is optimized to light during the day, bright light, tra- as it changes, different things happen and light going away. So if we screw up those signals, we basically, we basically increase our risk of all chronic disease. Wow. Okay. So, um, I know that you and I've been working together for a while now about getting, um, some of these things right. And it's, it's simple things like getting up and actually going for a walk first thing in the morning, right? exposing yourself to that sort of sunlight, taking off. Why taking off glasses? Why do you need to take your glasses off? I'm always intrigued by that. Yeah, because we need the signal through our eyes to our brain. We have a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus that's basically super light sensitive. And glasses, they they reduce some of the light signals. Mm -hmm. And like we mentioned before, so light isn't one thing. There's all of these different spectrums and there's infrared and there's UV and there's visible light. And we really need the entire, all of the signal to come through. And when we wear glasses or even work inside behind a window, we block some of the signals. So we don't get that full, um, basically, information download. Okay. So walking outside without glasses is certainly a way to get those things into the brain. As you said, exposing skin to the daylight as well is really important. Um, what else can you do? Also, so really important, get that 
you know, the signal throughout the day as the light changes. So there's two times a day, I'll say three times a day that they're most important to get that light signal. In the morning, midday, really bright. And then in the evening as the sun kind of goes down. So getting at least getting outside for 10 minutes, those three times a day will do wonders for your, your hormone balance and risk of all chronic disease. But then when the light goes away or when the sun sets, what we really want to do is to, like you said, avoid especially down lights. Uh, you know, our skin is sensitive to light, but the most sensitive part are the photoreceptor or the light receptors in the bottom back of our eyes. So light from above, like the sun, if it's fake light, is going to be the worst. From that, better is to have lights at eye level or below. So lamps are good, uh, down lights better. You can even get different bulbs that are a little bit warmer color. So the amber bulbs, the old incandescent bulbs are much better. You can go even further than that. And like we do, make your neighborhood think you have a brothel. You can actually get uh, red lights. So these are basically bulbs or, you know, LEDs also that are basically just of the red spectrum because the eyes and the the cortisol signals are most sensitive to the blue part of the visible spectrum. So when we use orange or red, it's going to be much less disruptive. Um, you can also wear blue light blocking glasses. These are yellow ones, so they're more of a daytime one that cut down some of the light signal, but all, not all. But you can get, there's, I mean, I guess kind of give a shameless plug. There's a company called uh, blockbluelight.co.nz in New Zealand, and they're excellent. They have um, light bulbs. They have amazing blue light blocking glasses. And if you're going to use any technology or be in a room, even in the bathroom when you're going to wash your face or whatever, you know, wear the glasses is so important. When it comes to, obviously, don't use screens if you can as much as possible after sunset. But there's a couple of cool um, overlays or apps you can download on your laptop. One is called Flux, and that's a free software. It's uh, justgetflux.com. And the other one that's a little bit better is called Iris. And both of those will basically change the color temperature of your screen to be more in line with it asks for your GPS location or what time you get up. And so basically it'll remove a lot of the, the really stimulating blue spectra as you get um, later in the day. So glasses, lights, what else? Your phone. I mean, oh, we, we all look at our phone, right? Oh, the phone is the big one. So I don't night shift and those um, things that come on the phone aren't quite enough. They still allow quite a bit of light. Don't know the website, but if you just Google um, red light hack for iPhone or Android, you can find some great info there. And that just literally means you can push a button and, and it will change it to a, a mode that cuts out all that blue light for you. Absolutely. It's interesting too. The, the spectrum of light, just like it controls hormones, also controls neurotransmitters. So the, the wavelengths that are used in most of our LED screens are closer to around 470 nanometers. And actually that's the very same in the same range of the, the light spectrum that simulates dopamine. So we all think, you know, social media and everything is so addictive because of the scrolling and the intensity, but also the light from devices is actually physiologically addictive and over time will decrease your dopamine, which can also lead to, you know, mood disorders and depression. So it's quite interesting. It is. You're doing a whole um, thesis at the moment, aren't you? On Oh gosh, I'm obsessed with this light. Wow, well, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, we think so much about diet and supplements and all these other things, but if we don't optimize our light environment, it's, you know, we're not going to get the benefits from these things because light is the fundamental driver of our biology so and controls everything. I mean, we know there's hundreds of studies showing that light at night from devices or even light, if if women or if people sleep in a room that's not completely dark, there's just the amount of light of, say, a street light outside shining in, our insulin level will increase. So if light can increase blood sugar, insulin, and cortisol independent of diet, then why aren't we talking more about light? I'm quite obsessed. No, and it's true. And as, as you said, that kind of an effect on your um, your entire body's functioning and what it, I mean, as you said, 3.4 billion years, whether the magic number is of us, um, where we've had that natural thing. And now all of a sudden we're, we're living in a very artificial environment where things are being, you know, unnaturally changed by our devices, by our lighting, by whatever it might be. Um, and we're seeing, you know, a lot more people being overweight, not able to um, get the body that they want to, no matter what they eat, how they exercise. And that really comes down to those circadian rhythms and getting those things right, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so getting the light is obviously really, really important. 
supplements. <laughs> I've, been, I've seen on TV they've got the, these, um, the, the real truth about um, various bits and pieces. I was watching one on Cosmetic Surgery the other day, and there was one about supplements as well. So there are different types of supplements, right? You can buy supplements from, there's rows and rows of them in the supermarket, mm -hmm. and you know, they, they make, there's a lot of money made out of supplements. Do they work? Do all supplements work? What's your view on supplementation? Oh, I come from a, my entire education was funded by my mom's supplement store. So, and, you know, so I've had a lot of experience in the industry and obviously as a clinician using supplements. And to start with, I guess it, it's important to understand that the supplement industry isn't very well regulated and there's a lot of on the market. So a lot of our, say, B vitamins or, or a lot of the vitamins we take are actually synthetic. They're made from coal tar derivatives, so the petroleum base. So even though we think, oh, we're taking a natural B vitamin, it could be, it's likely not a very good form. And a lot of the supplements mentioning forms are in the wrong form or that they, to the body. So they require a couple of enzymatic steps before the body can actually utilize them. So obviously we want to get our, the most of our nutrition from food. I think herbal supplements can be very useful in terms of treating certain conditions or shifting our body back to health, but I don't, I'm not anymore, I'm not a huge fan of kind of chronic long-term supplementation. In terms of quality, um, there is a big difference between the things you buy at, you know, the grocery store versus practitioner level supplements. So if you're, you know, and it has to be very tailored to the person, like they're very personalized, you know, just because one thing is good for stress for somebody, it's, it's going to depend on the underlying cause if they actually need that or will benefit from that. So I guess to kind of summarize, there's quality really matters and form matters. So a lot of the more practitioner grade companies, you know, they're producing proper GMP labs are, it is very important to kind of maybe speak to someone who's, who has a bit of awareness or do your own research. And there's a really good company. It's called consumerlabs.com. And they do a lot of testing on supplements because the other issue is the labeling. So because there's not great regulation, you know, what, or what you see on a label may not be what's actually in the supplement. So the Consumer Labs is a great place to look at uh, just in terms of brands. Pr being practitioners and naturopaths, integrated doctors, they can often, because they're, because they've done a lot of this research for you, you know, can prescribe things that are kind of professional grade, maybe higher dose in the correct forms. When it comes to herbal supplements as well or botanicals, plants are going to be different based on where they're grown and how much you know light they've gotten all these things so in terms of herbal supplements a lot of the reason why you know people say oh they don't work whatever is because the dose is wrong and because plants based on their environment produce different levels of some of the phytonutrients that affect if they're going to be effective or effective they're going to work in the body so standardized herbal supplements are, are really important so say you know, there's all this research on something like milk thistle being good for liver and regenerating liver cells. But the, but it, because there's such a variability, you want to look at something that's standardized to the active component of the milk thistle, which is silymarin. So there's all these little kind of tweaks you got to think of. But at the end of the day, if you don't get your light environment right, then you can spend a lot of money on taking supplements that may or may not work. Well, that's right. They're not being activated properly by the body. So therefore, that you might as well just um, flush them down the corner, really, mind you. <laughs> exactly. And, and also, I guess, I mean, you, you and I have been talking before we came onto the podcast. I mean, there's ways to test for certain things too. Like sometimes you may not need supplementation. Maybe you, you actually are getting the right amount of um, supplements from your food or your body is processing things well. So there are tests you can do for certain supplementation before you start taking supplements, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, just finding the root cause, like back to... You know, say maybe low testosterone or hormonal imbalances as women, you're know, looking at the light environment is key. The stress, you know, psychological stress, other, fa you know, what people are doing lifestyle wise. So for testosterone, things like caffeine, things like alcohol consumption will drop their testosterone. So if you're not looking, if you're not kind of thinking holistically and you just go to trying to take tribulus or something that's going to increase testosterone, then you're not addressing the root cause and you can spend a lot of money. And waste a lot of money as well. It's really so caffeine and alcohol. And I said, this is the, our favorite thing. Yeah. yeah. No, well, no, I want to talk a little bit about this because this is really important. I think often as entrepreneurs, one of the things we do tend to rely on is the caffeine to kind of give us that kick and keep us awake and, and give us the energy. And then alcohol can often be used as a, um, it, it becomes a habit, doesn't it? You come home in the evening and you have a glass of wine or a beer and it's your switching off from the day. 
And so that become, yeah, both of those become quite habitual. So what is the effect of caffeine and alcohol on testosterone or on hormones in general? I guess the biggest thing, especially with the, the alcohol, is alcohol will, or I mean, it's, it's for a short term. So a few hours after ingestion, a few, few beers, your testosterone will drop. And actually, I think that's behind a lot of the bar fights. So these guys, you know, you have some drinks, your testosterone is lower, your estrogen is now higher from the alcohol, and then you're more irritable. You move, you're more going to get in fights. But so the alcohol will interrupt sleep. And back to the hormones. So circadian rhythm again, our body gets used to going to bed at a certain time. And about 60 to 90 minutes after we generally go to sleep, we have our deep sleep. And then we get our growth hormone release. And growth hormone has a lot to do with testosterone and other androgens, which are that, that kind of group of hormones. And so if we're drinking, we're going to miss that deep, or if we're staying up late to drink even worse, we're going to miss that growth hormone release. And if we go to bed, say, an, even an hour later than we normally do every day, our body's used to secreting that at the same time, we're going to miss that. And that's going to first off, or that's going to throw up our hormonal cascade just from the alcohol at night. When we drink alcohol, we're much more likely to fall asleep quick, but go into a lighter sleep. And that can affect mood and hormone regulation the next day as well. And then the caffeine, big one as well. So caffeine will stimulate cortisol. And if you have caffeine too early in the day, your cortisol's rising, you've woken up. If you hit it with kind of that caffeine on top, that's just an extra stress to the body. And so anything that increases stress is going to mess up our hormones again. So perfect world. If you're going to have caffeine, not the end of the world. I like a good uh, coffee myself. Um, try to wait 60 to 90 minutes after waking and try to have it with some food. Otherwise, it's, it just causes a lot of physio or a lot of physiological stress. And then uh, going to work and you have traffic and everything else. It's just a bit of a, yeah, it's really hard on the body. A boost, yeah. Okay. And then in terms of alcohol, I mean, we're not... <laughs> We're not saying everybody has to give up alcohol. I mean, ideally, yes, we could get we eradicate it completely. But you know, if, if people want to um, work on, yeah, getting the most from it, if you like, what's the best thing to do? Perfect world. Have a long lunch. Have your alcohol. Finish your alcohol. This is a tricky part because those long lunches continue. But try to finish your alcohol two hours before bed, and that can really just help preserve your sleep. And by preserving your sleep, you're gonna have less hangover. You're gonna detoxify the alcohol better. And you're not going to have such a hit on your, your hormones. You know, I'm really big into routines and I'm very much, you know, I, I like to go to bed at a certain time. Um, but you've said that, you know, if you go to bed an hour later, it can have a massive impact on you. What about um, people sort of say, oh, but on the weekends I stay up later and, and throughout the week I go to bed earlier. I don't. I go to bed early every night. I'm pretty, I'm pretty much into a routine. But what, what effect does that have on you where you've got different, different days, different times when you're actually going to bed? I actually have a name for that in the research. It's called social jet lag. Ah. So just like if you were to take a flight and go to a different time zone, staying up an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, worst case, you, know, you have a really big night um, on Friday or Saturday, even though you feel like maybe you're recovered on Monday, it actually takes your body's circadian rhythm a few days to recover from that. So it's going to be about a day for every two hours of that, that or one to two hours of staying up extra late. So then, you know, by by Wednesday, you're probably still recovering from that night on Friday. So it's it's quite hard on your body. I mean, the circadian rhythm is so important for things like gut function as well. And, you know, throws off the gut microbiome and that can have effects on how we detoxify and clear hormones and that can increase estrogen and cause all kinds of issues <laughs> downstream as well. Wow. So, so ideally, uh, going to bed at the same, same-ish time every day is the best thing you could possibly do. Yeah, it's it sounds boring and... But, you know, if you're going to you know, have social events, ideally have them earlier in the day. And um, if you're going to misbehave a little bit and you know, use alcohol and things like that, you know, do your caffeine, your alcohol kind of earlier, or a little bit later caffeine, a little bit earlier with your alcohol and try as much as possible. Get that bedtime around about an hour, maybe 90 minutes later than you normally would. It's so important for health. Perfect. Okay. So... Is there an ideal bedtime? This is something that I've always <laughs> wondered. I, mean, I like to go to bed early, but is there an ideal bedtime for people? I think an ideal bedtime for most people is something you can stick to within that 60 minutes. So don't say, oh, I want to go to bed at nine o'clock every day if, you know, 11 is going to be closer. So just pick a time where, you know, it kind of accounts for an extra hour. Or so on the weekend and maybe an hour earlier, if you're having, if you're tired or want to have a little earlier night, 
So for most people, that's around 10. So that gives you and going to bed between 9 and 11 is going to be your, your window. Can you make up sleep? Oh, if, you, if you've lost a few hours of sleep because you've been having some fun or whatever it might be, or you're traveling, can you make it up? Not in the same way as like we think we sleep in, because then you're also sh- shifting your circadian rhythm as well. So best thing to do if you've had a late night, I know it's the hardest thing, is still get up early, still go outside. So you're going to recover better, actually, if you get your circadian rhythm optimized versus if you just try to sleep all day, because then you, you, you further kind of pushed out the recovery for more and more days. Okay. So we've discussed quite a lot here, but if I can summarize some other things. So what I think I'm hearing is that, you know, if, if for, for both males and females, if you're finding yourself a little bit more irritable, not quite so um, able to concentrate on things, uh, you're, yeah, you're struggling to be motivated to finish things, it could be there is an imbalance in your hormones. And that imbalance in the hormones comes from, um, yeah, initially from circadian rhythms um, and, and reducing the sort of stressful environments. So looking at those and making sure that you're maximizing um, the circadian rhythms and getting them right. And then supplementation can be helpful if you've got some some um, missing things, I suppose, in your diet, yeah? Anything else you would add to that? So that's my very, very brief summary of quite a long conversation. <laughs> well, back to the kind of physiological stress, I think a big one to keep in mind of is obviously our breathing controls our stress response for our vagal tone and our, ox- our oxygen levels in our bloodstream will, will also determine if our, we're in a stress response or a you know, relaxation response. And so another big thing I see quite a lot with people that are stressed and especially people, um, if they're uh, under a lot of pressure, maybe they've gained a bit of weight, they're not following their, their lifestyle, you know, normal lifestyle habits, is this idea of mouth breathing or, you know, when you're stressed and you're at the computer and your posture is bad. And when you start breathing through your mouth, that basically kicks your brain into stress mode evolutionarily, we're only supposed to breathe through our mouth when we're stressed and running away and, you know, we can't cope with the the load of the exercise or the um, exertion. So nose breathing is so important for stress. And because it's so important for stress, it's really important for testosterone and our sex hormones. So becoming a nose breather, even when you work out, obviously, if you're pushing it, breathing through your mouth is appropriate. But as much as possible, breathing through our nose, really important, especially at night. And this is a big one. The snoring, sleep apnea will absolutely destroy uh, testosterone levels. But even just just mouth breathing is, is, you know, people with allergies have been found to have lower increased risk of cardiovascular disease as well because that's stress response and then much lower hormone levels. So, you know, or being mindful or assessing how you're breathing at night can be really helpful. And I think we talked the last time about, um, about, the mouth taping and things like that can be. And it's really interesting because you said, you know, with allergies that I do actually have some hay fever only since I moved to New Zealand, but since I moved to New Zealand, I have hay fever. And I was really nervous about taping my mouth and trying to breathe through my nose because I thought, well, I get blocked up. It's going to be really challenging. But in actual fact, what I've now learned is that I breathe so much better at night when I have my mouth taped. And even when I don't tape my mouth now, if I forget, I can, I still actually find myself breathing through the nose. It's starting to train me to breathe that way. And I don't have the blocked noses. I don't have the sinus issues that I used to have. So it's actually helping, surprisingly. Yeah. No, it's definitely a big one. I mean, when we breathe through our nose or when, when our body senses we're breathing through our nose, but we're not getting the, the full breath or the amount of oxygen we need, our body will actually, or we'll, we'll produce something called nitric oxide. Just that's the same, uh, neurotransmitter or hormone that causes erections in men. And our, our, our nasal tissue will actually expand to accommodate better better airflow so well and so uh, it's, it's, i can speak from experience it certainly has words not, not with the erections but yeah <laughs> okay good um so we've got breathing we've got circadian rhythms we've got supplementation anything else we should be aware of what else can um you know lead to stress and lower testosterone levels or hormonal levels in either sex yeah i mean a big one i think tests with testosterone that's not that not that commonly discussed is our exposure to environmental estrogens. So fight our um, xenoestrogens, which are compounds in the environment or from our food that are getting in the body that actually interrupt our hormone, our proper hormones. And they tend to decrease um, testosterone preferentially and increase and can be stimulate, stimulating to estrogen. 
So things like phthalates are a big one. You know, they got they got rid of a lot of the BPA and stuff in, in bottles, but the other plasticizers, the things that make plastic soft. So if you're eating, if you're a guy, you're eating a lot of, you know, takeaways, things that are being microwaved in plastic, all of those those plastics, especially with, you know, fatty foods, get into the body and can actually lower testosterone. So it's a big one. An interesting one that I recently found out about is um, a lot of workout clothes and uh, active wear is actually they use a like a um, like a chemical in the in the clothes that acts as a hormone disruptor. So, you know, the wearing gym clothes too much can actually through the skin. It's it's more of an issue of women cause hormonal hormonal disruption. Does that not wash out though? I mean, does that stuff not wash out when you wash your clothing? Yeah, over time, but it's it's the stuff that um, like the sweat guard stuff and all those chemicals that are in the clothes. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And for women it's even worse. I mean, we have a such a high risk of or high rate of things like endometriosis and fibroids in New Zealand. And, you know, a lot of us guilty too. You know, we're we wear yoga pants with that underwear and that's directly against our mucous membranes. And so we're absorbing a lot of the chemicals from especially the newer clothes into our body, which can disrupt our hormones. It's actually, and also, you know, things or things like pesticide residues, they can be xenoestrogens. So that's why, you know, organic food is, is beneficial for hormone balance and uh, male testosterone. And just being really, but the big one, you know, if you live in the city, filtering your water is absolutely, I think, one of the most important things you could do for hormone balance and overall health. Because a lot of the environmental chemicals end up in the, you know, the water table end up in our our drinking water and our, unless we filter that, we can be, that can be a source of hormone, dis, hormone disrupting chemicals. Okay. Lots to think about. Okay. So we, we, if we had to summarize it into three kind of key things you would encourage somebody to do, if they feel like they might be, mm-hmm. um, you know, at risk of stress and low hormone levels, what would be the three things you would suggest that they, they undertake? Definitely get your light right. <laughs> it's boring. I know. Get your morning light, you know, get, get outside during the day, block that light at night. Really assess your breathing would be quite important. Diet and we didn't really talk too much about blood sugar, but for men especially, if you if your insulin regulation is off, if you're gaining weight, um, men's fat cells have a hormone called aromatase, which will take testosterone and turn it into estrogen. So being mindful of you know your eating styles, you know eating seasonally and locally is so important. Keeping your blood sugar regulated is really important for hormone balance as well. So breathing, you know, our breathing and our stress response is probably the key thing I want people to take away. There's plenty of things there. Perfect. Now, I know that you do. You do a lot of work with entrepreneurs. You're all about actually helping entrepreneurs who want to make a difference in the world and by helping them to make a difference in their life. Um, what's your ideal kind of um, client that you work with? Again, I'm, I like to work with people that are ready to make changes and that are open to modifying their schedule to make changes. So I you know, there, there's different stages in people's health and also obviously their business and as you're building their business. So there's obviously this, or there's often this, this kind of period in entrepreneurial life where it's, you just got to push through. So that's not a great time for me to work with people, you know, if they're kind of working towards a goal. But ideally, we want to kind of work with people to support them before they get to the point of burnout. Because once people reach this idea or get to this point where they're kind of burnt out, they're already very inflamed. Their blood sugar is all over the place. They're not sleeping well. Their hormones are out of balance. Then it's a lot harder to fix things. So perfect world is people that are, you know, aware enough to understand that by putting the time, the effort and making the changes to optimize their biology, it's, it's worth it. It's a good investment to do it now. So earlier in the game, um, better than later, but also do work with people that are already kind of, you know, need help because they've, you know, they're getting sick a lot and they're not sleeping well. But I guess, sorry, back to the original question, um, accountable people, people that are ready and you're going to make the changes. Because a lot of my recommendations aren't just like, take this pill. You know, I'm asking you to actually make the changes in your life that are going to Stop drinking your coffee health. first thing in the yeah. morning. Yeah. Lay that caffeine. Just do it for a month and see. And I think that's actually a really good way to approach things, right? Because we've just had this conversation about myself before the podcast about <laughs> it'd be better if I didn't drink coffee when I first woke up. And um, and it really is about trialing things and being prepared to give something a go and see what effect it has and then making a decision once you have an idea what kind of effect that has had on you. And I think that's probably the best way to approach it is to kind of get this is not, it may, not, it may, may be forever, it may not be forever, but give it a try and see what actually happens. Absolutely. 
Yes. Hey, look, thank you so much for coming in again. Always lovely to see you and thank you for sharing all your knowledge. Uh, we'll put the website that they can get hold of you on in the, the notes for the show. But um, thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks as well, too.